Hi right, folks, welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And in this chapter, we are, or in this lecture, we are getting into the fifth chapter of Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics and looking at living in line. Uh, and what this chapter is all about is how lines, words, and balloons, uh, the uh, shapes around uh, words in comics, uh, how all those things can represent and provoke emotions in comics. So part of this will be about emotions, uh, but we'll also be talking about synesthetics or art that unites all the senses. Uh, so if you think about a visual medium like comics, it's just you're looking at things on a page, uh, but yet we're having all kinds of sensual responses. You're smelling things, you're <laughs> tasting things uh, mentally, of course, uh, as well as having these emotional responses. So there's, there's quite a bit of intriguing uh, phenomena going on as we read these comics. And surprisingly sophisticated, you probably haven't ever even thought about it before, uh, before McLeod starts pointing it out. So I, I love this stuff. Uh, we also talk about some of the different line styles, and I guess sort of the emotional layers of different popular as well as some very independent, I guess you could say unpopular, but that makes it sound bad, you know, but <laughs> it's like, I guess, obscure or uh, indie uh, sorts of comics that only uh, aficionados um, pay much attention to, like R. Crumb, for example. Uh, but we'll see in those, they're doing some pretty wild stuff uh, with the way they draw uh, backgrounds and shapes and characters and so on. Uh, they certainly have a different feel to them. And then we'll look also at some other cultures. So a little bit of a, a glimpse into manga. You know, we haven't really talked a lot about that in this course, but uh, again, I know some of you read a lot of manga or Japanese comics, basically. And you know that uh, the way that things are portrayed in those, the uh, emotions, emotional states, uh, you know, basically all aspects you care to talk about <laughs> uh, are quite distinctive. And you know, it's, uh, I mean, you get used to it uh, relatively quickly, but there first couple times you pick up a manga, you might have to have somebody, uh, you know, like, what's going on with this? <laughs> uh, the, what, what kind of emotion is this supposed to be? I, I don't even recognize it. Yeah, and we'll get into like why uh, that's the case. Why, why would it be different in manga than it is in, say, a Marvel or a DC comic uh, if they want to show somebody uh, being sad? Uh, okay, uh, he starts off this chapter with some pictures or some line art, and he asks, uh, can emotions be made visible? So anger. You, know, you don't really see anger walking down the street. You can't point at something and, oh, look over there, it's anger. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, anger is an internal uh, emotional state, right? Uh, I mean, you probably know what it feels like, but trying to uh, draw it or portray it and some, basically externalize it somehow uh, can be difficult. Uh, and yet, you know, we do it all the time. <laughs> you see it everywhere. Uh, so he's got some examples here, you know, and, and some of these I think are probably easier to spot than others. You know, I'm always reminded of those psychological tests you might get in a, a counselor's office where they're like, uh, you know, I'm just going to hold up these images and I think they're called like Rorschach test or something, you know, and tell me how this makes you feel. You might see something like this, and <laughs> say anger <laughs> or fear, you know, uh, emo uh, uh, but the idea is they're triggering some kind of uh, emotional response. And the question that he's, he's going to come back to a couple times in this chapter is, is this like some kind of primordial instinctual thing just all humans sort of see these images and uh, experience that kind of emotion that goes with it uh, or is this just something that's convention driven uh, so one artist does it uh, they make it clear that it's supposed to be anger uh, and then other artists see that copy it and it becomes kind of this, this convention where everybody's uh, copying it and using it but they're not really sure anymore where it came from or what the original context of it was. But since it's in such widespread use, we as a society or a culture basically uh, know what it means and we just kind of go with it. You know, so it's, it's probably somewhere in between those two extremes. Uh, then he talks about the senses again. Uh, so we talked about emotions, now we're moving on to uh, senses, sight, sound, smell, etc. Uh, so can you draw a sound, you know, like loud? <laughs> can you draw a feeling like cold? And this is, you know, some, he gets a little bit here moving uh, in, onto this page where he talks about Kandinsky. Uh, Kandinsky. Uh, but really, I was going to mention that there's been some 
a lot more done in this area since McLeod wrote this book. But it's, it's some pretty fascinating things, actually. In, in the communication studies uh, program here, they'll talk about this. I don't know if you encounter it so much in rhetoric, but <laughs> basically they've, they've done some work with brain imaging, putting people into FRMI machines and having them visualize things. Well, they'll say, you know, imagine you're mowing the grass. Uh, you know, really focus in on that. You know, visualize it, daydream it really uh, as powerfully as you can. And then they'll do the, you know, the imaging. And what they find is that a lot of the same stuff happening in the brain will go off, you know, just as though you were actually mowing the grass. So they can have you mow the grass, do the scan. Just think about mowing the grass. <laughs> you know, again, triggers all these same uh, regions of the brain. And so it's not just, uh, you know, there's something to this is basically the point. It's not just uh, all imagination and, and no bearing uh, on reality. It's, it's really to the point now where uh, coaches, you know, if you have a, if you play sports, your coach might have told you at this point, uh, even if you can't get to the gym or to the field to practice, if you just uh, really just intensely think about it <laughs> and visualize it, uh, that can, uh, believe it or not, actually improve your performance. You know, again, because it's just it's doing the same uh, work mentally. Obviously, you're not doing uh, the physical exertion, uh, but it, just kind of running through it mentally uh, will improve uh, the performance, and that's basically science at this point. So, uh, you know. That's uh, <laughs> pretty cool, right? <laughs> okay, so then he, uh, I, I, I got kind of jumped ahead into the Kandinsky, uh, but he does talk about how in the world of art, so if you take an art history course, you know, they'd be talking about this. Uh, the artists uh, for a while were really interested in, during the Renaissance, basically, uh, trying to make things really uh, realistic, you know, getting the lights and the shadows and all that stuff just right. A lot of work with uh, very advanced paints and colors. Uh, really trying to make this uh, realistic. And, and from there, uh, they went into these, remember last time we talked about the, the nude descending the staircase, you know, trying to get at these sort of mental images, uh, which they still thought is realistic. You know, the, uh, the, 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 it was a Duchamp and that nude descending the staircase. You know, the idea wasn't that this is uh, doesn't look like anything. It's supposed to actually look more like uh, a person walking down a staircase uh, than a photograph would. And that was the goal anyway. I know it sounds a little bit strange, but <laughs> it always kind of uh, seemed a little strange to me too. Uh, okay, but anyway, the next step after that was this express expressionism. And so this was the idea of, again, not trying to portray something that looks like a photo. Uh, again, by this point, why, why would you even bother? You know, why bother drawing something uh, or painting something that looks really realistic when you could just snap a photo. <laughs> You're not going to get more uh, realistic looking than the photo, uh, right? Uh, and these artists were saying, wrong, uh, because the photo can only capture, you know, certain sorts of light and, you know, whatever's going on on that film and, you know, the, the science of it is kind of beyond me. Uh, but the artist can sort of get in there and portray things uh, in a subjective uh, way and, and somehow, it some it gets it, it can it's able to convey things uh, that's internal or unseen. Like this really famous painting here at this top left corner is uh, called "The Scream" uh, by Edvard Munch. Not, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Uh, but anyway, a lot of people like this this painting. They have uh, the prints and the posters in their dorm rooms. Uh, and it's it's kind of a, an unsettling, wouldn't you say, kind of eerie looking image. Uh, but if you really look at it and you start trying to ask yourself, you know, what is going on here? It's not like a realistic, it doesn't look anything like a photograph. Uh, instead, it's kind of, to me, there's a lot of curves and like different textures of lines. You know, some of these are thick, some are thin. They're all kind of wavy and they're kind of close together. There's not a lot of uh, room in this painting for things to, to settle your eye on and uh, <laughs> kind of relax. <laughs> You know, instead it just kind of makes you whoosh, kind of kind of queasy almost uh, looking at that. Uh, you know, and this is you know this it's not like well, Munch is a scientist working in a lab with a, with a brain scanner and nothing nothing like that. Uh, he's just trying to get at this you know this this feeling he's having of uh, being scared or, or screaming or whatever the case may be, and then uh, trying to use his art uh, to convey that uh, in a way that other people can 
appreciate and look at and say, yes, that is, <laughs> you know, I see what you're doing there. I'm feeling, I'm having this emotional feeling looking at that painting. Yes, and here we go. Uh, we call this idea synesthetics. Uh, so this is an art that might somehow unite all of the senses. And there's a lot of examples of this. I know I talk a lot about restaurants and grocery stores, but... Uh, uh, you know, what can I say? We all got to eat. Um, but one of the examples of synesthetics from that world, so it's not just comics, but they, uh, in the food industry, they will use sound in ways you probably haven't thought about. So the, the classic example is a bag of potato chips. So they make those bags, uh, like let's say it's a bag of Doritos, right? So you open that bag, and it's, it's kind of a loud sound. And, you know, if you're in a classroom, <laughs> it's kind of quiet. <laughs> you know, everybody can hear you open up that uh, bag of uh, Doritos. Or it was a can of Coke, right? They, you know, that's a very, they, li they like that. Because uh, when you hear that sound, it's almost like you can suddenly taste uh, the Doritos. Or you can, uh, you know, taste that Coca-Cola. and almost, you know, again, kind of triggers those same uh, responses in the brain. Uh, so there, and of course, the sound of the crunch as you're uh, eating those uh, Doritos, that's another example of this. So the idea is it's not, don't get so fixated on like one sense or a one medium, right? just side or just, you know, most people think chips, uh, they think taste only. They only think about the taste uh, when really there's a lot more senses involved, right? The smell and again, the sound of that bag opening uh, and so on and so forth. So there's there's a lot of science behind this and it's applied Again, not just to art and comics, but even, you know, as that example shows, uh, to the food <laughs> uh, industry. And, and, of course, television commercials, you know, you see the burger, you hear the burger sizzle, you <laughs> get real close up on it. <laughs> uh, all right, anyway. Um, yes, in truth, don't all lines carry with them an expressive potential? And so here he's moving from... It doesn't necessarily have to be much and like fine art. Uh, a lot of these humbler comic artists, whether they realize it or not, are applying a lot of these same techniques, uh, these different kinds of lines and the different emotions. So we got savage and deadly there with that kind of streak, kind of weak and unstable. And again, a lot of this is subjective. You know, if you didn't have context, you might not know what, what, what why is that curvy? <laughs> it might not make much sense to you. Um, but what happens is over time, uh, these things, uh, well, let me just uh, jump back here into McLeod because he's got the examples. So let's look at this, this uh, top panel I've got highlighted here. And he's got four examples of different kinds of line style. Uh, and the one on the left is Dick Tracy. <clears throat> Not really so popular anymore. Uh, this was a little before my time. Uh, but Dick Tracy was a comic book or comic uh, strip character. And you can see that it's um, kind of sharp angles. He says bold lines, uh, obtuse angle, heavy blacks. You know, all of those suggest the mood of grim, deadly world of adults. And then right next to that Dick Tracy cartoon, he's got uh, Scrooge McDuck, or Uncle Scrooge, from uh, Carl Barks, another classic comic artist, uh, very famous, very influential. Uh, but if you really just get in here and look at the the lines, basically, you can see that like there's a lot of circles, a lot of ovals, a lot of softer curves on the uh, on Uncle Scrooge, as compared to Dick Tracy with those sharp sort of a lot of right angles and uh, again sort of heavy uh, colors. Uh, so he says that the Scrooge uh, the Scrooge image kind of evokes this feeling of whimsy, youth, and innocence, as opposed to this grim, deadly world. Of adults so uh, here's the problem though you know some people look at this and they say well it must kind of going back to our talk of uh, the gestalt theory if you remember that you know really looking at the shapes themselves and thinking maybe these round circles it's kind of a psychoanalytical thing um, same thing with those sharp corners you know maybe as a kid you like hit your elbow on a sharp corner of a coffee table <laughs> you know and somewhere subconsciously that's being triggered when you look at a sharp corner in a comic you know, so there's that kind of approach. Uh, but the other approach, or the other way to think about how you might explain this, is through conventions. So all these uh, artists here, yeah, the formalized language can evolve. 
Yeah, so if enough artists use the technique, he says, uh, other artists will pick it up. And he's got a really good example of that here with this uh, the smoke coming from a, this pipe he's got. So there, if you look closely, you can see he's got some little little lines coming out of his pipe. And he says, you know, it's kind of, a, we're kind of used to seeing this, at least most of us are probably, these little lines, wavy lines coming out of a pipe or something uh, burning. And we know that's supposed to be smoke and smell like smoke uh, versus this one here with the, it's got the same wavy lines, but now there's like some little buzzy things, uh, bugs, flies uh, flying around. And he makes the point that we just kind of know those are flies, but they are very abstract. You know, it looks more like little boat ties uh, than anything else. It's, it's definitely not like a very uh, detailed, realistic drawing of a fly. And the reason he says that we still are able to interpret that image is that we've seen this sort of thing so many times in other comics and so many by so many different artists. You know, maybe at some point you had to ask your mom or your dad, you know, or brother, you know, whoever, sister, uh, who had the comic before you did. You know, what is this? And they say, oh, that's the smoke or that's the stink, you know, coming off of that. And those are flies. And so then you can just kind of uh, pick that up and you don't think about it anymore. It just kind of becomes uh, almost subconscious. You just see this and you... Uh, automatically start to smell it or at least realize that that's supposed to be stinky. He says that's kind of a, a way that languages work. Right? They start they start off as uh, being very representative of something. You know, a drawing has to look very much like the thing that it's supposed to be. Uh, here, like this ox. Uh, so that's the only way you would be able to talk to somebody or, or keep a record of how many oxen you've traded is if you drew every time, like took, a, took great pains to like make a realistic looking ox face or ox head, just so everybody could look at it and know what that was supposed to be. <laughs> uh, but over time, as more and more people are doing this, they eventually say, you know, maybe we don't have to draw like the whole ox every time. Maybe we could just draw the head of the ox and people would get the point. Uh, or maybe we're kind of in a hurry, so we're not going to bother with the ears and we're just going to make a couple of lines, you know, make it kind of triangle, stick a couple horns on it, <laughs> you know, bada boom. Uh, so the, this is a, the theory is, at least what McLeod's uh, theory here is, is that they might start off realistic, but then they eventually become more and more abstract. And of course, the ultimate abstraction would be the, the languages and, and the sound system uh, that we have. So it is a theory. This has been challenged. You, know, you can read different linguists talk about this in a different way. You know, I'm sure there's a lot more uh, uh, conventions going on. A lot of this we're not aware of, uh, how this stuff works. A lot of mystery around these these questions that McLeod is posing here. You know, this part here to me is really probably the, my favorite part of this chapter. What happens when a language evolves in more than one distinct culture at a time? So you've got comic books becoming a big thing in Japan, you know, as well. And so you kind of got these parallel uh, developments. Of course, a lot of other countries, too. I guess every, every I guess pretty much every country has its, its comics. Uh, but they don't always do these things in the same way. You know, just like we don't all speak the same language. We don't have the same hand gestures in every language. So colors don't mean the same thing. <laughs> uh, and the same thing with, like, e emotional states. So if we look here, this is, a, I guess, yeah, a Japanese comic. And you can see anger looks like that. The hair kind of up, the eyes a little bit bloodshot looks like. <laughs> Whatever this is coming off the sides, some smoke maybe. Uh, dementia, uh, lust, you know, sleep. <laughs> like for these, I would definitely have to ask somebody that knew. Like, well, what's going on here? Why is there like this uh, snot bubble or whatever that is coming out of that person's nose? Uh, oh, that means sleep. So this is a good example here. And really the thing to keep in mind is just how much of our, you might think that looks different or you wouldn't know what that meant. Uh, but that just goes to show you that this stuff is not universal. All right, that they just sort of coincidentally, you know, I guess Karl Barks or whoever back in the day was drawing these things this way and said, told somebody, oh, well, that means sleep. Uh, other people copy it 
gets copied and copied and pretty soon it gets uh, down to that symbolic level like with those flies you know I'm sure the first time somebody was doing this trash let me go back to that trash image for a second yeah uh, so the first time you had this you know an artist was trying to get across this idea of really stinky smelling trash uh, so they probably had to show you the trash a lot of detail they probably had a character off in the background saying wow that's really stinky <laughs> you know oh, that's you know what a horrible odor you know they had to have all these different cues uh, working in conjunction uh, with these lines coming up and maybe they had uh, very realistic looking uh, flies uh, buzzing around it so you didn't you knew it you would be able to figure out what it meant uh, but then the next few times I wanted to draw that or somebody else picked it up. Maybe they didn't go in for that much detail. Uh, maybe it kind of been established at that point that that's what these lines meant. So then you could just leave out some of the detail. And uh, again, it's like making a copy of a copy of a copy. Uh, eventually you can really just kind of hint, draw like one wavy line, you're done. <laughs> okay, so moving on from that idea, he talks about uh, the word balloons. So just the way, I know I always thought this, just as a writer, you know, that's, that's my, my thing. I'm not very good with, with drawing, <laughs> uh, but I do, I do like to write. And one of the things that has always puzzled me, or used to puzzle me, I guess I should say, was uh, why do comics have these handwritten, everything's always handwritten with the letters, right? It's usually like this, all caps. But if you look really closely at it, you notice there's a lot of more there's a lot more bold in comics than you typically see in say a novel, uh, lots of bolding, lots of italicizing, uh, but really it's even beyond that. And there's there's a real reason why comics typically have somebody that does the they call it the lettering or a letterer. So it's, you know the bigger comic book shops, or the big uh, comic book publishers, they will have dedicated people who do nothing but just you know they're handed the text. It's probably typed out. And then they painstakingly uh, write it out with special, you know, pens and pencils. It's a, you know, it's a pretty big deal. And you think, why don't they just use a computer or a font, you know, a word processor, and just have the professional fonts there? But, you know, I have read comics like that. And it's a totally different feel. You know, there's definitely something about even the way these letters are drawn. It's very, you know, it's hard to, to talk about specifics. Uh, but all I can tell you is if you switch back and forth, you'll definitely notice a difference. There's something more uh, evocative, I guess, about these, these ways that these things are handwritten out. Now, it's obvious uh, when you look at some of these kind of extreme examples, like the Ark, <laughs> Timber, <laughs> you know, with uh, something like Timber, you notice how it's got, it's got like the explosive word bubble around it, you know, the kind of evoke uh, excitement. Uh, but then the, if you look like the, like the timber is bold, it's kind of at an angle, it's kind of jagged, and they got those really jagged looking uh, exclamation points. Uh, so I think all of that stuff sort of works together. Uh, but my point is, something like this is happening even in like these regular, uh, you know, regular lettering. Uh, so there's, there's certainly an art to it. I think it goes a little bit under underappreciated because uh, you probably don't even pay much attention to it but you know next time you're reading a comic really look at these uh, closely at the way well let's just do it for fun as <laughs> uh, so I this is I hate this panel it makes me feel kind of disturbed disturbed by this but there's kind of a guy here talking about his dog he says I just want you to know that I am on to your plot I know you put something in my dog's food that made him not love me anymore <laughs> so, so obviously this guy's supposed to be crazy something is not right about him and you can tell that by looking at his face you know these sort of eyes there's kind of a lot of extra lines there it looks a little bit you know like he's tired or exhausted his face is kind of at an angle but really what i notice is that the if you look you have to look really closely here let me zoom out is there a way i can zoom in <laughs> oh where we go Uh, okay, and so if you look closely here, you'll notice that these letters are a little bit crooked. Like some of them go a little bit to the left, some of them go a little bit to the right. It doesn't quite line up horizontally or vertically, you know, compared to this 
top piece. So if you look at the lettering there, and then you get down in here, and again, it's something like, look at the word food. You notice how that F is kind of like hanging down a little bit lower and those O's aren't quite, you know, the same shape. So I don't even know if McLeod himself uh, is aware of what he's doing there. But again, this is a really good example of how just those way that you draw the letters uh, can convey some of these emotions. And I think the brilliance of comics, you know, at least a good comic artist is, again, you're not even aware of like 99% of this stuff. <laughs> you know, you just read it and you're like, that was a great comic. You know, that really kind of got to me. You know, I had a really a strong emotional response to that comic. Found it really exciting, you know, or something like that. And then uh, not really gone back and figured out, like, why was that? You, know, you just kind of take it all for granted, not noticing. Well, it's like clever stuff, like changing up the way words are drawn. Uh, the stuff going on in the background, like, you know, this coming back to this guy with a dog, <laughs> you know, like here's a, they put that kind of spirally thing in the background and that provokes a different response than if you just have a blank background. Okay, I hope you found that fascinating. Now I have a question for you. All right, so flip through The Walking Dead uh, and then I want you to pay attention to those pages, the panels, where there's some kind of intense emotion going on. There's plenty of them. <laughs> so see if you can find like a really big panel or full page or something. Uh, and then look at the line work. Now, so look at the way things are drawn. Is it, this, is it consistent with the rest of the comic? Usually they'll go back and forth between like a highly detailed panel versus a very abstract one. And so see if you can figure out what the relationship is there. Uh, and then the lettering. You know, so I want you to pay attention to the, like the way those words are drawn uh, in different panels when the character is supposed to be having different uh, emotional responses. Is there something going on in the background? Is there a very detailed background or is it like a spiral or an explosive look, a bunch of lines, you know, see what, what, what's happening there. Uh, but basically just find a really emotionally charged panel uh, and then note how the lines, the letters in the background, all this stuff uh, works together to invoke uh, all of those emotions and senses. All right, I hope you had uh, some fun with that. As always, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please do make a comment or ask a question, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.